Hey everybody, it's another episode of Comics Are Great. Thank you for downloading and thanks for participating live. For those who are here live in the chat client, we record every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, aadl.org, on the corner of 5th and Williams in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, I'm Drew Zutros, cartoonist and teaching artist. This is a show about visual storytelling, and I'm so glad that I've got another visual storyteller to talk about it with me. Dave Roman, yaytime.com, is here on Skype with me, sporting his uh, nifty Harry Potter scarf. Is, is that a specific uh, house scarf? Yeah, I believe it is a Gryffindor house scarf. I, I'm, I'm guessing then that uh, you, you lean towards the good guys. I do. I do lean towards. I, I, I think when you know, when uh, when everything goes down, you want to be on the right side. <laughs> so you're not you're not a, a Snape fan or a uh, oh what's that a Draco? Um, I do like Snape, but uh, I've never been one to want to align myself with the Dark Lord. <laughs> That's right. We should say this. You're one of the most. Chill okay, what we're gonna do today? Before we're gonna do this in a second. We're gonna, actually this, this is a fun one. There's no show next week because I'm gonna be out of town. But uh, so because it's like the last day of school before a little bit of a break, it's like you have a good fun blow off day at school, right? And so we're gonna have a fun <laughs> conversation where we're going to have a nerd fight over which is better, Harry Potter the series or the Chronicles of Narnia. But before if, before anybody starts, you know, screaming for blood like at a hockey game or something. <laughs> Uh, we, we should say that Dave is one of the sweetest guys in comics. I've met him personally. I can attest to this. He's a very sweet guy. <laughs> and he's clawing at the screen as I say that. Uh, very sweet guy. And, and I, try to, I try to keep my, uh, let, let the angel on my shoulder do the talking most of the time. Uh, so this is going to be a fight, but it's not going to come to blows. It's going to be two guys who don't get why the other one likes the thing that they like so much. Try to try to convince each other that theirs is better so that the other one will love it, not so that they can win a fight, right? I think that that sets the tone. Yeah, exactly. I don't I, I think there's nothing more annoying than someone trying to convince you to like something that, you know, you're just not into. Um, but what I don't get is why you don't like it. Like a lot of people, a lot of friends of mine don't like Harry Potter. I get it. That's totally fine and I just you know, sweep it under the rug, but uh, but you is a, it's a little bit enigmatic based on your sort of cachet of other things that you're really passionate about. So I'm viewing this more as like getting you on the psychiatrist's couch and figuring out, you know, where, where did Harry Potter drop the ball for you? <laughs> uh, it, it is interesting. And before we go any further, I, can I ask you to like turn your camera just a little bit to your right? There we go. So you're more in the shot because every time you lean into your mic, it's like you disappear. There we go. Awesome. So yeah, you know, as I was thinking about it, because I've been thinking, you know, you did research for this. Uh, I did a, a cursory sort of examination of what my thoughts are on this. And, and I th the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, Harry Potter really reads in, in a comic booky style. And what I mean by that is not bam, pow, all those kind of corny things that we think of or the general public thinks of, but I mean in that kind of very direct and visual kind of staccato style that comics work in. So you'd think I'd love it. But um, for some reason, it just it just always left me kind of uh, wanting more, uh, not wanting more story, but like, really, is that all you got, J.K.? I, I don't I don't get it. So uh, we'll we'll get to the bottom of that in a second. Before I go any further with that, that's our tease. And now we got to talk about something really important. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's I'm right. Blind. <laughs> <laughs> so how is Astronaut Academy doing? This book that you did that came out from First Second Publishing. Um, I think that's one of the hardest questions to answer is when someone asks you how is it doing give me some sales numbers dave while we're yeah. in public <laughs> <laughs> yeah well first off the book just came out a couple of weeks ago so i don't think i will get any sales figures uh for a very long time um and when you do a book with a large publisher you get paid in advance so it takes a long time for them to sort of make back their money yeah um, so Okay. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. I um, think, that, I, I then, think yeah, go ahead. people are still welcome to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't I, retired yet. It, I think what people ask, what they're really aiming for when they ask that question is like gut reaction. How do you feel about how things are going? I don't think anybody really wants to get a spreadsheet of how sales are going. But are you getting good response? Are you getting people retweeting? Are you getting emails? Are you getting back pats? I mean, do people seem excited about the book and are you happy with that? Or are you feeling like, man, we got to give this thing a better push? 
Um, yeah, I think it's probably going well. I, I, I also think it's hard to gauge based on what people are telling you because for people to be like, by the way, I didn't really like your book. I, mean, I know, I know. Not a, <laughs> people are being very nice to me about it, but what's going on on the, sh you know, on the shelf and in the stores, uh, it's still too early to tell. But yeah, I, I'm, I, I get the sense it's going, going well. It is tough to gauge too. I, I did a talk recently, not too long ago anyway, and then after I did the talk, I, you know, I'm mingling with the people, and everybody's like, that was fantastic, that was a great talk, you were so energetic, blah, blah, blah. And so afterwards, I was talking to some friends, and I'm like, they're like, well, how'd it go? I'm like, well, everybody seemed to like it. They, also, they said this, they said this, they said this, and they're like, yeah, well, they kind of have to say it. Nobody's going to come up to you and say you stank right afterwards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of a cynical way to look at it, but, you know, yeah. I guess. But Okay, but let's talk about the book just real quick, give people a sense, because we never have had time in past episodes to really dig at what makes this book tick, what makes it so good. And I did a blog. I did a review on comicsagreat.com. Uh, it's in, Just click on the blog link. I don't remember the exact address to the review I did, but I did some fan art for you, and I shared a few thoughts on what makes this book so great, in my opinion. And whenever I've asked you to describe the book, you always kind of look down on the ground and shuffle around. <laughs> well, it's kind of about this school where kids go to school, and the story's told from different student standpoints. Um, let's... let's if you like Harry Potter, as Dave does, if you would wear a, a Harry Potter scarf in the middle of summer, uh, I think you'll like this book. It has a lot of that kind of um, vibrant sincerity that the, the Potter books have. Uh, also, has a lot of references to things that we uh, guys our age uh, probably love. Like there's uh, a giant, com giant combiner robot team of heroes. They all have their own vehicle. It turns into, oh, what, what's the name of the robot again? Uh, the robot is called Metador. Metador, uh, yeah. Transform into Metador, please. And I don't know if we can even get this in the shot. I can hold it up and see if anybody can see it. But yeah, and then there's uh, the guidance counselor or the guidance chancellor uh, has a striking resemblance to uh, some, some favorite villains from uh, an army action series from the 80s. Uh, but also, <laughs> are you not allowed to say GI Joe? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be, I was trying to be clever, uh, and I always fail at that. But th th there's another thing that, that comes up when people talk about this book is that the the dialogue style is very unique. I wonder if you could speak to that. This, th if I get really specific, I bet I can get you to give me an answer. Why do people talk so weird in Astronaut Academy? Because uh, let me see if I can find a line. True, you are very smart because I built you, which is genius. <laughs> Um, yeah, everybody speaks in overt statements and run-on sentences, and obviously that if you grew up watching anime or Godzilla movies, uh, you know that that sort of uh, comes out of bad translation. Um, but what I wanted to do was sort of create a scenario where, since the book takes place in the future, everything's more hyper, information is coming at you more rapidly, um, these kids actually are born with multiple hearts, so everything about them is more... Uh, advanced and more intense so that's just the way they process information and speak um, so it's sort of like a continuity justification for uh, bad English <laughs> <laughs> but you you know how to write this was an intentional choice it's not that you write bad dialogue right I mean, right 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 I mean yeah. that's that's why it's it's really actually hard to talk about because I don't want it to just sound like oh I'm just making fun of Japanese movies or something like that it is actually um, not only is it intentional but the idea is that the sentence structure sort of leads to uh, different types of wordplay and sort of uh, different ways of reading sentences that sort of create extra jokes um, on mm -hmm. top of what's already going on. And, and it kind of reminds me of, I mean, as a guy who works with a lot of young kids, it reminds me of the kind of sentences that young kids write when they make comics, too. And the, that, that was the big takeaway as I finished the book for a third time was... Dave really understands how to get into that mindset and write like a child, right? You know, which which sounds like a, a, a backhanded compliment, but it's not. It's it's it, that's hard stuff to actually think like a kid and how a kid is absolutely sincere, and there's an internal kid logic to what they do that, uh, it, it, when you look at it, it communicates, right? Uh, so. Anyway, I, what, what I said in that review is that it, when you read some books aimed at young people, it has that kind of affected voice of the breathless storyteller who's regaling the children with an adventure that's going to be good for them. But you're, the voice of Astronaut Academy that I thought was so neat is that it felt like it was kids talking to kids, right? It felt authentic to me. So, and, that, and I think that, that's, that dialogue contributes to that. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Uh, it's certainly the goal 
um, but it's one of those, yeah, whether or not it was successful or not depends on the person. And, um, and I think that's actually, that actually ties into why when people ask, like, how is it doing? Um, I knew going into publishing this book that not everyone is going to appreciate that element. I knew that the dialogue could actually be something that turns certain people away. But for the people who get it, and I think specifically middle grade kids and, and sort of people with who have grown up uh, loving sort of uh, not only anime and manga and video games, um, but also just the English language and sort of the ways in which, you know, sentences can be sort of shifted around. Um, one of the other major influences uh, was actually British comedies like Monty Python um, and sort of sketch comedy and stuff that sort of plays with wordplay, um, but doing it sort of for the kid uh, level. Um, so, yeah, hopefully it worked out and hopefully people get it and don't go, oh, is this book intentionally written this way? Or, I, <laughs> <laughs> I have seen one or two reviews where, where they're not sure. You know, yeah. like they're just, I think this is what he's going for, but I'm not totally sure. Yeah, yeah. So, well, anyway, it gets my seal of approval. So people who are watching should go get this book. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Is that the pl best place to get it, Dave? Um, I think IndieBound. Indiebound. is probably the best way to support your uh, independent bookstores. Um, but Amazon is absolutely fine. BarnesandNoble.com, any of the major booksellers will carry it. I'll tell you what. How about this? Uh, if you are of good, if you are good of heart, if you have lots of hearts, like <laughs> the characters in Astronaut Academy, you should get it from buy it from IndieBound, but then go to Amazon and put a uh, a review of the book, uh, a thoughtful review, uh, not not just a. Pretty cool. <laughs> I like it. It's fun. Don't quite That's get all the jokes. <laughs> well, I guess yeah. Even just giving it a star review helps. You know, it's, it's, I was I was I posted that review uh, on Amazon that the one I did. And it didn't even occur to me that, yeah, you know, this is, like, that's the number one place for discoverability for books. So if we want to support our fellow cartoonists, we should all be going on Amazon and giving reviews of their books if it's there, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, because that is the first place that I think people check when they hear about a book. They'll go to Amazon. Like, even if they don't plan to buy it on Amazon, I think yep. people look at Amazon to sort of see what the book is about, if there's any preview pages, and mm -hmm. then what people are generally saying about it. So, yeah, thanks uh, for for helping the positivity meter go up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I'm, I'm just mentioning that I did the review not to get a, a, a thank you from you, but also just to lead the charge. You know, it's like, okay, I did it. Now everybody else has to do it too. So everybody who's read the book, uh, go, even if you haven't read the book, just put a nice review <laughs> on there. <laughs> but no, but get the book. You won't be sorry. If you like the stuff I do, uh, you will like it. Or you might not, because as we're about to talk ab uh, about today, they're, 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 I, I surprised Dave by not liking Harry Potter. Or yeah, not loving the Harry Potter series. Let's put it that way. I think it's good. I think it's a good adventure story, and but it just didn't captivate me to the point where I wanted to do fan fiction or put on fan plays or form a band based on the the, the, the book series. Um, so okay, let's talk about why that confuses you, Dave. Make your case. Make your case why I should love this series. Um. Well, obviously, it's going to be different for everyone. Sure. Uh, maybe I will start off by just listing some of the things that drew me into the series um, and why I sort of fell in love with it. Um, uh, I actually came into it first because of the illustrations. Um, I thought that uh, I really like Marie Grand Prix's illustrations and when I saw the cover illustrations and I saw the spot illos, that's actually what first drew me into it. I really like her art a lot um, and I like that the series seemed to be a very visual series. Like something about the kid, the way the, kid, way the kid's dressed, the scarves, the wizard robe combo, you know, the owls, the flying cars, the, you know, everything just looked kind of cool. And what I specifically liked about the illustrations is that they were this combination of designy and realistic. Like they, they were, they weren't like too realistic. Like a lot of the fantasy books growing up that I read, um, which I all love, like I love the Dungeons and Dragons books, the Dragonlance, Lord of the Rings, all that stuff. It's always very sort of realistic um, rendered illustrations and uh, Marie Grand Prix has this sort of like almost like Batman the animated series painted uh, feel about it. everything's uh, geometric shapes and stuff um, so that was the first thing second thing was the tone um, a lot of people really tend to focus on how oh each one gets darker it gets darker it's darker um, but what I liked about it is the the sort of combination of whimsy like it sort of felt like a Roald Dahl book you know the whimsy of Roald Dahl the world building of Tolkien uh, 
And then the sort of like popcorn sensibility of George Lucas um, in that it's not trying to be super high art. It's definitely supposed to be like a summer movie and there's set pieces and there's sort of action scenes and everything moves at sort of the pace of like a summer action movie uh, a la like Steven Spielberg or George Lucas. Um, and so again, it's this mix. It's like this, uh, there's humor, there's drama, there's scary bits, there's soap opera. Um, and I sort of equate it to like Avatar The Last Airbender, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, things that um, take the dramatic part seriously, but then also are sort of mixing in humor every step of the way. Um, and then one of the things that I think is uh, one of the elements that I think kids really like about it is that it also mixes in grossness into that as well. So it's got the scary, it's got the soap opera, it's got the drama, but it's also got, you know, uh, booger flavored candies and slime and, you know, creepy crawly things. You know, every step of the way, like right up until the end, there's still that like level of sort of like kid gross out humor mixed in with all this sort of, you know, uh, operatic uh, continuity stuff. Um, number three, the biggest thing probably for me that sort of kept me in the series were the characters. Um, I love fantasy across the board. I'm, I love Narnia. I love Dark Materials. I love Lord of the Rings. I love all this stuff, but what I always feel is lacking in those books are the characters. Um, I don't feel like I actually want to spend time with a lot of the characters in those other series where with the Harry Potter books, even if you don't like Harry Potter, which that's totally fine, <laughs> you know, there's Ron, there's Hermione, but then the cast keeps expanding and keeps getting more rich and every single character not only feels like a real person, but they have this, every character has a backstory, every character has a quirk, none of the characters are one note. None of the characters are like just there to sort of provide a role for this plot. Every character has, you know, all this sort of like nuance and sort of um, relatability, I guess. Um, and I sort of, you know, we'll get into this sort of Narnia uh, pros and cons later, but, um, <laughs> but okay. So like, so then that leads to the, just the level of detail, um, much like Star Wars, where every single thing in the Star Wars universe is like potentially a copyrightable toy or a trademarkable thing, the Harry Potter universe feels like that. Even though she's sort of mixing and matching all the stuff that existed, like she's like in a lot of ways that series is a mashup of pre-existing fantasy tropes. She sort of puts her own spin on it and sort of modernizes certain things and sort of creates a sort of like trademarkable version of all these things that we may have seen from other books or other series. Um, but every level of detail from the food that they eat um, to the books that they read, um, you know, there's like all these universes within universes. And yet, for some reason, there's still like all this stuff that feels like she hasn't filled out yet. And it's sort of like there's all these cracks that can be filled by fans and people can sort of imagine, you know, well, what is this guy's story? And what is, you know, what was going on during this time? And I think that's where the fandom comes from and the sort of fan fiction and all that stuff. Um, so I think the final thing on my list is, oh, two things. The continuity, that sort of ties into it. The fact that each book progresses the story forward and obviously is built into this. Oh, we losing you, Dave? Sounds like Skype just choked. You there? Oh, am okay. I back? Yes, Hello? you're back, yes. I thought I was okay. going to lose you Sorry. altogether, but you just got so excited. It just, it, oh. Yeah, I got excited. Um, the Ministry of Mad. The Ministry of what? Run that by me again because you froze up again, Dave. The Ministry of Magic, I'm guessing, is what he was going to say, everybody. <laughs> oh, and we did lose him after all. I'm going to try calling him back. It's not, it looks like his Skype crashed or his connection was lost, one of the two. But we'll give this another try, everybody. And we can always fix this in post if we must. And if I had a live guest today, I could just turn to them and start talking to them about something else altogether while I was waiting for Dave to come back. But this is, this is the, the risk you take when you do a one-on-one -on -one interview over Skype live. And there we go. We got him back. See, it didn't take long, I think. Hello, Dave. Oh, it's still connecting with him. <laughs> Eric's saying I should interview Sergeant Slaughter on the table here. For those who don't watch the videos, um, 
we actually record the show as a video show too, which uh, currently, you, well, actually they're embedded in the post when I post updates to the to the show uh, on the Comics Are Great website, comicsagreat.com. But it's also available at um, currently youtube.com slash comics are great. And uh, the guys have, uh, at AADL have been working on doing some really interesting multi-camera shots showing all the toys in the studio. So you could see that Sergeant Slaughter is flexing to show his approval of what's happening. And I could talk to him. I could say to Sergeant Slaughter, oh, there's... Sorry there's the, about that. No. I got too excited. <laughs> you filled the internet with, with, with joy and happiness and enthusiasm, and I choked yeah. on it. So Dave's back. Okay, I was just about to start talking to my Sergeant Slaughter toy. Uh, okay. So I've you were saying Ministry of Magic, right? Yes, yes. What about the Ministry of Magic? You were, you were just talking about it when Skype... Oh, no, they... they, they confiscate they, they disconnected us from the because we're <laughs> saying things that the ministry doesn't want us doesn't want out. <laughs> is that it well you said you had two more things on your list but before we lost each other um i can't remember i'll just say the the diy message the fact that ultimately the books are about kids needing to educate themselves taking power into your own hands questioning authority um power of friendship but in a really tangible way rather than a sort of like abstract like, yay friendship is you know magic um <laughs> it's like you know it's very uh story based um and i think that's a huge part of what's like also led to the sort of subculture of the fandom like the wizard rock movement and the harry potter alliance and i can go into that stuff later okay well the, 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 it, it's interesting to me that Chronicles of Narnia doesn't have that kind of fan interaction. And I wonder if it's probably partially because of the age of the story. Like, the story was written so long ago, and it's been, you know, passed on for generations. It's written in a completely different style. It's written in an older, what I prefer, <laughs> a style I prefer in, in uh, young people's literature. Because uh, that, that was my big beef with Harry Potter. My, my number one beef was Rowling's writing style. Uh, it wasn't the elements, it wasn't the characters, it wasn't wizards, it wasn't scarves. Um, what, what bothered me was that this is Harry. He's mad. Well, show me he's mad. Say he's mad. Describe his anger in such a way to make me say, oh, he's really mad. But Rowling's writing style is very direct. And then other things in, in the books are super loud. Like, I like Hagrid. I thought Hagrid, when I, when I got to him in the, in the first book, I was like, okay, this character I'm going to like. I always love big, monstrous-looking characters who are really sweet. But is like every two pages, Hagrid is crying about something and beating his <laughs> chest. And, and after the third time in the first book where he starts bawling about something, I'm like, okay, rolling, I got it, I got it, got it. He's very emotional. Don't do that again. Show him show emotions in other ways. Oh, now he's hugging somebody really hard, you know? It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it felt like she was just screaming the characters at me rather than letting me interact with the characters and learn to love them on, at my own pace. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, that's fair. I think that that's fair. Um, but but when you when you compare it to like a summer blockbuster, I mean that that kind of reminds me when people say, well, it's it's a popcorn movie, you know, it, it not check your brain at the door movie. I don't I don't buy into that defense for anything. But when somebody says it's a popcorn movie, it's like okay, well yeah, you know, as a guy who gets irritated when people ask, you know, oh, does Voltron hold up? You know, no, it's not supposed to hold up. It's a kid's show. <laughs> you know, don't compare it to Sense and Sensibility. But, uh, but when you say it's, it's, it's like a popcorn movie or a summer blockbuster, then it maybe, maybe my um, criticism kind of falls flat at the writing style. But, no, I think that's, but I think that that, I think that's still valid. I think that, like, comp if, if you compare it to Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials, I think those books are obviously superior in writing style. And if you're talking about prose, if you're talking about yeah. language, if you're talking about, you know, all of those things, absolutely. I think that J.K. Rowling is a very sort of in and out kind of writer. Um, but I, 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 I don't buy into the, her, I, I think that people are a little too critical of her writing. Um, I, I don't think her writing's bad. I mean, you compare it to something like Twilight, I think that J.K. Rowling is a genius. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> you want to just go there? <laughs> yeah. We just start bashing on Twilight now because I think we can both do that. Yeah, well, that's it's. Yeah, uh, I don't want to go there either because you know, <laughs> Twilight, you know, Twilight has its fans, and, and that's fine. My, I, I, but I'm I, I, I think that the valid criticism of Twilight is the writing style, obviously. My criticism is too much winking. Just like how Hagrid cries too much in Harry Potter. <laughs> Everybody in Twilight is winking at each other in the books. Stop the winking! 
I get it. <laughs> that, that's what, that's it's not it's not the uh, the 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 messages that it's sending young girls that bothers me. It's the winking. But anyway, go ahead with what you're saying. Sorry. Um, but so so my interpretation of a popcorn story or popcorn film is mostly just that fun comes first, um, rather than sort of anything else. Like I think at the end of the day, fun is the priority, um, and I think that for the most part is true of most of the Harry Potter books, at least the first four, um, and then maybe six. Uh, fun is definitely comes first. So even though like things are getting really serious and the messages are getting heavier, there's still love potions, there's still flying cars, there's still sort of the ridiculous things that are going on and, and sort of like you know flying brooms and all the sort of action-y stuff um, definitely takes precedent over, you know, the metaphors, I guess, or anything deeper than that. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess this is where um, I can segue into talking about where I'm coming from with Chronicles of Narnia, why I love, love sure. those books, and I think the movies are fantastic. I know some people don't dig them because they fight in the sunlight, and I'm like, that's awesome! That finally, a mythical monster fight with the sun shining instead of so much rain I can't see what's going on. Uh, sure. I love fantasy. I love fantasy. But one of the one of the, the faults of fantasy and, and Lord of the Rings is a big one for this. And let me let me back this up by saying I've read all the books twice, read the Silmarillion. I've done my time loving the Lord of the Rings. But one of the things I think it's guilty of sometimes is it's what you were describing with with Harry Potter is the details of the world become way too important. Uh, living in this real world uh, gets in the way of story. Uh, and what, what, I, what I'm talking about when I say story is like, what are the characters going through? Are they achieving something? Is there some kind of idea that's being conveyed through the plot? Uh, am, am I getting a sense of what the author's mind is here and what the plot mind is and all that stuff, right? And Tolkien stuff will kind of get lost in just enjoying the world. Yeah. And by contrast, Narnia, he gives you just enough. He gives you just enough, and, and Lewis's writing style is extremely descriptive. I mean, in his uh, second book, The Space Trilogy, Paralandra, he spends an entire chapter describing water without using the word water, which is, delights me, but I can see the, how that would make his books impenetrable to some people. Um, but he doesn't get into that whole world building of where the lineage of all the characters are. He gives you just enough main characters to sign on to the story and then shows a few per uh, periphery characters to like, like Reaper Cheap or Miss, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. Uh, but then the other thing that I, that I love about it is the metaphor and the allegory. Let, uh, okay, for those who don't know, for the two of you who are listening who don't know, uh, Chronicles of Narnia is an allegory for Christianity. <laughs> Aslan is Jesus. Uh, we all know this. I mean, in the third movie, they pretty much say it point blank. Um, but, so, but because of that, I don't think that limits the book at all. I don't think that makes it less accessible to an audience. In fact, it me, to me, here's the comparison I'm going to make. This is going to be my first attack at you, Dave, at, at your beloved Harry Potter. <laughs> is because it plays with these big ideas that mankind has been sort of wrestling with for centuries, it feels like he's on a higher playing field dealing with the mythology of the gods in his way, whereas Rowling, because it's like, well, it's a, it's a magic school with magic kids and magic monsters, it feels like it's an after-school special by comparison to the ideas being explored in Chronicles of Narnia versus Harry Potter. <sighs> All right. Now we're going <laughs> to now we're gonna get, get dirty. <laughs> um. I'm not a fan of mythology. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, Let's hear it. I'm going to come out and say that. So uh, stories about gods doing battle with gods uh, is very non-interesting to me. Um, and that's sort of where I do come at it from Harry Potter. And, and, and I think that it is true that the first two Harry Potter books are very after-school specials. Absolutely. I'm not, you know, I'm totally not going to defend that aspect of it. But I do think that Ultimately, the, the sort of subject matter that she is tackling is racism and sort of class uh, hierarchy and just sort of this, uh, you know, generally, you know, on the really sort of surfacey way, the fact that wizards on the dark side basically believe that because they are superior to humans, muggles, that they can do whatever they want with them. And the idea that they have to sort of hide and sort of be second class citizens to humans which are weaker you know which are ultimately weaker creates this sort of like racism and that sort of goes that becomes the the theme throughout all the books whether it's racism amongst wizards themselves in that like if if a wizard is 
a born in a, a in a family. So if you're born and you don't have powers, you're a squib. You're treated as like you're this like you know uh, bastard child that you know does not deserve to go to Hogwarts and all this sort of stuff. I'm being really sort of uh, I'm not coming with the best examples, but um, but these things become they take on a lot of weight over the course of the series. Um, and then it's also just about authority, and I think that that you know w you know with the power. Uh, metaphor translates to authority because there is this ministry of magic and they're supposed to be the ones that are ruling the wizarding world but they are you know easily corruptible and often misinformed and they're sort of all about spreading misinformation and it's about questioning you know what is the media telling you um, and some of this stuff is very on the surface but it gets deeper and I think that um, ultimately like I said the message of these books is that kids have to teach themselves and you can't trust authority and just because Aslan the lion tells you you know that this is the way things are that doesn't mean that is actually the way things are and that you should actually you know question what they're telling you and learn for yourself um, and that's not just to be paranoid because there are you know adult figures that are trustable and sure. uh, not everybody is corruptible but certainly uh, certainly the government <laughs> <laughs> Wow! Who knew that Dave was, had a streak of anarchism in him? Uh, how, how long has it been since you read the Narnia books? Uh, since last night. Um, did, did you read them? Um, yeah, here's the thing about those books. Um, I think I read them out of order. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. right so there's this, this horse's boy and yeah. the magician's nephew. And yeah, yeah. I read that one first, and then I found out that Lucy went through the wardrobe. And, um, yeah, 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 yeah. The order of the books is a little convoluted. It's a little tricky. So what year does <laughs> Prince Caspian take place? I, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> no, I, I read the first book when I was a kid. Um, yeah. And I thought it was okay. Like, I, 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 I didn't think too much about it, to be honest. Like, I, I just sort of read it and wasn't compelled to read the sequels. Um, that maybe because it didn't have a cliffhanger ending, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I've watched, uh, I, I saw the first movie when it came out. Um, and I saw the second movie. And, uh, and then, like, last night I read The Magician's Nephew. Yeah. So, so I, I can't say that I'm an expert. Um, well, no, I, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, you know, attack your credibility on this. It's just that when you, something you said earlier suggested that in yeah. the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Aslan just says this is the way it's going to go, and the kids just sort of, like, trot off and obey. And that's certainly not what happens in there. I mean, there's as much uh, about self-reflection and self-actualization in Narnia, the, the series, as they're, well, as what you're describing in Harry Potter. I won't make a direct yeah. comparison because I haven't finished all the books. I've read the first book all the way through, the last book all the way through, and I've breezed through a couple of the middle books. And I want to talk about the last book a, a, a little bit later. But, um, but anyway, you know, I mean, Edmund and Peter. Edmund and Peter are exact, perfect examples of how there's the choice. You know, he made the wrong choice, and he did the selfish thing. He... Uh, sought to just please himself first and foremost. He had a bit of a nasty sense of humor. Uh, Peter, on the other hand, uh, was, was the one who made the right choice, Goofus and Gallant. But then in the later stories, you know, the, the, Peter himself gets to uh, face hubris and figure out, you know, and, and the thing about that that I think is so compelling is Aslan's right there. There's God. God is right there saying, hey, you got to make the right choice, and you still make the bad choice? How do you do that? You know, we're really broken creatures. And these, these four kids who maybe don't have as loud of personalities as the kids at Hogwarts, uh, they get to explore some really compelling ideas by making the wrong choice in the presence of the creator, you know? Uh, I thought, you know, and then, then things like, Going back to writing style, this is one of the things I love about Lewis, and this is a quote I use all the time, is Aslan's standing in front of the kids, and he's telling them, this is a scary thing that you got to do, and I can't help you. Uh, you got to fight this witch, and she's got all these monsters. And the, the quote went something like, when Peter heard the words, he thought of the word adventure. When Edmund heard the words, he thought of the word danger. That's a really interesting way to describe two people's viewpoints without saying, Peter was brave. Edmund was scared. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's another reason right. I think that I, I get lost in the poetry of Lewis's work uh, as well as the adventure. But then also, 
the other thing that I think is really neat about Narnia is Lewis knows how to deal with magical creatures so as not to treat them as purely black and white, even though it is a story about good and evil, uh, is that, you know, in some of the stories, Minotaurs or Minotaurs or Minotaurs, I don't know which way to pronounce it, um, they're, they're on the bad guy's side. Other times they're on the good guy's side. And the thing is, is not that they're good or bad, but that they're kind of wild and they're unpredictable, just as nature is. Nature is not good or bad, but it is in the right context. It's a good thing. In another context, tornadoes, it's a scary thing. So Lewis knows how to make monsters feel that way instead of like going back to Tolkien or uh, other fantasy stories. Um, I'm an evil monster. I'm a good monster. You know, that's really what you get. So, yeah, that's that's totally. Um, but I think the thing I don't like, and maybe this is my you know, non-religious upbringing, uh, is like so like when I read The Magician's Nephew, there's this whole scene where Aslan creates Narnia, and he basically sort of delegates and says, okay, you animals are now my chosen animals, and the rest of the animals are the dumb animals, and <laughs> you will have sort of you know minion over them, you know they serve you technically, and don't end up you know don't go back to being like those dumb animals because you know I will take away your you know your power of speech you know as quickly <laughs> as I gave it to you, um, and uh, yeah I don't know like that just like I just that just doesn't do it for me I don't know there's something about that creation myth stuff that always uh, bugged me. But again, that's, that's why I would never read that book first. Like, I think that The Magician's Nephew is, is more interesting after you've read uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which I, I, like, I like that book a lot. I, I, like, I think that that one, um, like, going back to it, uh, having reread it and watched the movie, like, I, I do think that that is uh, a satisfying story, ultimately. Um, but I think that Harry, but just to defend Harry Potter as far as like gray area, I mean, they've got all their levels of that too with their creatures and their monsters as well. There are creatures that seem like they're demonic, but they're actually like the Thestrals look like these like horrible, you know, hideous creatures, but they're actually, you know, very beneficial animals that help them, you know, on their adventures. House elves, there's this whole plot line in the fourth book about, you know, the morality of having house elves and whether or not, you know, this constitutes slavery versus free will are they servants because they want to be servants or because they're you know controlled by the wizarding race um and that is something that carries over through the whole books and um i think adds a lot of depth if you will <laughs> <laughs> i'm not really good at like talking scholarly I, I, I it. it's cool man well ni neither of us are scholars <laughs> I don't think anybody came to this thinking that they were going to get a dissertation or that they were going to get something from the University of Missouri Press or Mississippi Press, rather. Um, okay, well, I want to hear why you don't like mythology so much. I mean, uh, not, not that I'm trying to convince you to, to like it and not that I'm like a big mythology buff, but uh, I, I, it's interesting to me to hear somebody say that they don't like it. Usually people are like, oh, yeah, mythology is cool. Yeah, I think for me is because I think it's that plot versus character thing that you were talking about. Um, I think as much as plots are great, and I, I think that plot is important, I think what brings me back to stories is characters. And like I said, characters that I enjoy spending time with tend to trump story. That is why, for example, I'm not a fan of the show Mad Men. A lot of people talk about what a great show it is, and I, and I agree that it is extremely well made. But I don't enjoy spending time in that world, and I don't enjoy spending time with any of those characters. Yeah. Therefore, it doesn't keep me coming back. Um, with Harry Potter, obviously, I enjoy spending time with those characters, so it, it keeps me coming back. So even if the plot isn't moving forward, and you're right, I think that that is, I think an extremely valid criticism of the Harry Potter books is sometimes the plot does not move forward very fast. They do spend a lot of time just sort of going about their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and that's sort of what's unique about those books is that each book takes place over the course of a year and you really feel like you spent an entire year with them, good or for bad. So, you're, you know, the boring classes, the fun classes, you know, the days where nothing's going on. You know, sometimes the plot doesn't move forward for, you know, entire chapters because they're going about their school life. Um, and I can see that driving people crazy. But if you enjoy the characters, then you don't mind spending time with them. You're happy to hang out with them in Hogwarts and, and, and sort of go through the process that they're going through to sort of uncover mysteries or whatever. Hmm. Um, so, uh, is, but it's not, 
Okay, see, I was expecting you to attack something about like the whole idea of dealing in metaphor. So that part doesn't bother you. It's the part that you just don't get rich characters out of. Like when you read the story, the Twelve Labors of Heracles, right? It's not. It's just that he's irresponsible and he's rash and he's really strong. And that's pretty much it, you know. Right, right. And then it's just sort of like he did this, then he did this, and then he did that, and this happened, and then she became this, and this turned into this thing, and that person, be, you know, gave it that person. Um, <laughs> You know, and it's like, it's that sort of like matter of fact, like, you know, character existed and then he pulled another character out of its mouth and then it became its son and now it gave that son lay of all this land and everything's just sort of abstract in general. Um, and you don't really feel like you're, you're, you're getting to know them as people and what they're really thinking, what, you know, what their insecurities are, what they're, I'm more interested in getting into the character's heads. I'm more interested in the emotions, I guess. Were you a Marvel or DC guy when you were growing up? Um... Yeah, so I'm a Marvel. Yeah, definitely yeah, Marvel. Yeah. But but I do. I mean, I like. I do like. I do like iconic heroes, though. Like I do like Batman and Superman sure. for the sort of that well, idea that like the idea you know the idea that Batman's costume is like you know this identity thing that someone can come into and and you know I do like that element of it, but um, but beyond that, I never got into like Green Lantern or any of the sort of like the the Jack Kirby gods or any of that stuff. Yeah. I oh definitely, my gosh. Yeah. I'm definitely more into the Peter Parker is Spider-Man and, and, and the, and the X-Men. I, I forget if you said this on the show before or not, but I've heard this out of your mouth a couple times, so it could have been anywhere. Um, you once de described, you wanted the, uh, fantasy worlds that you could actually walk into. You wanted a fantasy world that you open this door and now I'm in it and it's, it, it's here now. And you know, I think that's the difference too, between Harry Potter and Narnia is Narnia is like walking into another world. It is not this world. Time doesn't even right. work the same way. Yeah. And that's one of the things I love about it because it's like, oh, I just walked into Asgard. I'm in a completely different place, completely removed from the world of humanity, a higher place, right? Whereas Harry Potter is sort of like, it's parallel. It's here now. And it's something you just like take one step to the left and you're in it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's why I can enjoy both of them. Um, and that's why this is not really like a big debate because, <laughs> because, because I do love the setup of Narnia. I love yeah. the idea that a kid's, you know, they're playing, you know, they're exploring a house and you go through a wardrobe and, you know, go through the coats and whoa, now I'm in a total different world. I think that that's fantastic. Like that's what fantasy ultimately should be. I think what Harry Potter is, is just sort of the reverse. It's that the fantasy is all around you. You just don't see it. Most people don't realize that the wizarding world actually exists you know, in the same world as ours, it's just that we can't see it or that we're not paying attention. Um, I think that that's an equally valid fantasy setup. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but so going, I, I forget where I was going with the mythology thing, so I'll just dump it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think okay. it's very healthy to dump your mythology. <laughs> See, that's just it though. Is I, like, I like stories too. And one of the things I love about Narnia is it feels like it's dealing in, um, it's dealing in something that's more timeless. Okay, here here's a way to frame frame my whole uh, idea. Is one of the reasons I don't like or I get really itchy about catchphrases, like when a new catchphrase pops up, like you know, in the last couple of years, fail. You know, when somebody just goes fail, this fail that, um, or what's another one that got picked up for a while there? But you know, like uh, about ten years ago, when people say the bomb, this is the bomb. And I and I always got a little. It, it, <laughs> Can I say my current one? Pro that? tips. Pro tips. <laughs> I hate when people are like, "Pro tip, don't walk on this side of the street." Yeah. <laughs> I see that on Twitter every once in a while when somebody yeah, wants yeah. to say something snarky. You know, snarky. There's another one that just popped up in the last like eight years, and I never heard it before that. Is the the reason that I get itchy about them is that I it, it's so it's it's like fashion it's like getting hung up on if you're wearing the right shoes like, like the kid in high school said is that a J Crew shirt does it matter you know does, does it look good do I like it that's all that should matter there right and when a story feels to and this might be me penalizing Harry Potter unfairly because it's recent but when something feels like of its time. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more suspicious about it and a little bit less likely to invest myself because it doesn't feel like something that could be read 100 years from now and enjoyed in the context of that time where, you know, when you read, well, I don't know, do you, when people read Jane Austen, do they appreciate it in the context of its time? Yeah, yeah, of course they do. I think now do. they do, yeah. yeah. I, think now it's, I, well, I think now you're looking at that as, how, oh, look at how different this culture is from our culture today. Yeah. Uh, 
with the Jane Austens. Yeah, I think that that's about. I I I'm. I have similar feelings about a lot of things. I certainly like timeless quality. I don't like when people try too hard to be modern mm -hmm. and put cell phones into a story just because like oh. kids are on cell phones today or whatever. You know, we, I think you guys have talked about that. Well, uh, yeah, we, we, and we need to get Raina on uh, to talk about this. I know this is something she's been struggling with with a project that she's working on, right? Is writing yeah. like fiction for that age group. Like how much do you have to put that in there to be to feel authentic and uh, appropriate to the audience? Yeah, right? and the worry is that you're instantly dating yourself because yeah. you know technology increases faster than you can draw a comic. Um, but I think Harry Potter, what's interesting about Harry Potter is it is actually because they said, okay, this is the first book and each book takes place a year later. Um, by the time the books, the final book came out, it was very much a period piece because, you know, time moved a lot faster than J.K. Rowling wrote those books. Right. Um, but... But I don't think it's as important because I think so much of the time spent in the wizarding world is timeless. I think that's supposed to be the idea is that Harry and the Muggles live in the, you know, I mean, or today it's modern. But when you go into the wizarding world, they don't know so much about all the modern trappings. Like there's a lot of sort of humor that comes out of uh, wizards not knowing the way that the human world works because they haven't kept up with technology. Because they have magic, they don't need to sort of keep up with trends and technology and what's going on or fashion or anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really anything pointed out to be modern is there to sort of contrast the fact that the wizarding world is not modern. Well, and, and actually, before anybody mentions this in the chat, I'm surprised nobody has mentioned this in the chat, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe does take place during a, uh, a specific time, right? And right. the writing style itself dates the book, but the ideas that it deals in and the voice of Lewis as an author tends to feel, and again, this is where I'm, I'm not sure if I'm unfairly penalizing Rowling, because time will be the test of that. And I mean, a hundred billion people can't be wrong <laughs> <laughs> about, about a book, you know? Uh, but it just seems like the, the when you deal in mythological ideas, you have more of a, of a chance of be, of having a timeless feel to it, and that's that that is attractive to me as a reader. That's why I prefer stories like Lewis's work over, say, Rowling's work or even uh, Lemony Snicket. Uh, I'm trying to think of other contemporary writers that are popular with the young people right now. Although Pullman, Pullman did have that vibe to it. Uh, that, that kind of like dealing in the higher mythological ideas as well as the, the more political on the ground oh, yeah. ideas. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, it, it's interesting that you described the book the way you did. I mean, it makes me feel like um, Rowling is a, a much more Western writer than even Lewis and those guys, like kind of preaching that individuality to kids or teaching that individuality to kids, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's, I mean, I know it seems sort of jokey and I'm just sort of like focusing on it, but it really is an important message about those books. And, and, and I keep going back to the books because I think that the problem with the films is that they really sort of shorthand everything. So you don't really get a lot of the sort of complexity and the sort of nuance uh, that the books have ultimately. <laughs> The books are but I guess that's better. true. That's going to be true. That's going to be true of anything. But oh yeah, um, I mean, I was just talking with somebody before the show about uh, about how the the Narnia movies are oh, as good as they are. I mean, I love the Narnia movies, but they're never going to be as good as the book because how do you capture Lewis's description style, Lewis's nuance, L Lewis's way of of making describing a twist of Peter's lip or whatever to really make you understand how that character feels when an actor has to interpret it. It's just, it's never going to be a as good. But at the same time, the great thing about movies is, is that I got to see that scene where cheetahs and rhinos and tigers <laughs> and bisons are all running across this grassy field to fight against all these goblins and minotaurs and whatever. God, that was amazing. And the, the fact that the sun was shining. L listen, fantasy movie makers, please. It's, it, would it kill you to have the sun shining when characters are fighting you know that was that was in in the second film um what was the second one prince caspian right um where peter actually fights the 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 main bad guy on that battlefield and that bad guy was absolutely menacing oh and there goes dave but as i was saying everybody who's still listening uh i thought that the the fight in the second film between peter and the 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 guy from the telmerarians tell oh i forgot how to, how to pronounce that somebody in the chat can maybe inform me on how to pronounce telmar Telmeranians. Um, but yeah, that guy was absolutely frightening, but yet they could fight when the sun is out. 
which was a refreshing change of pace in, in a fantasy movie. Uh, sometimes I feel like filmmakers are trying to put on too much texture in these things. So we'll try to get Dave back, hit the hang up button, and then hit the call button again. So, okay, folks, uh, for everybody in the chat, before I get Dave back, I'm going to ask you guys, in a few minutes, we're going to start wrapping up. So I'm going to ask you guys to all start voting. Who won? Who won the fight? Or the sort of fight? The kind of fight? And you guys can uh, type your vote in the chat, and I will tell, tell Marines. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, but yeah, I want, I want to just give a, uh, either Harry Potter or Chronicles of Narnia. Not your vote on which one you like better, but which one of us made the more persuasive argument. We got one more, one more round in this fight to go through. And I'm getting Dave back now. There we are. Sorry, my internet stinks. <laughs> no problem. I mean, uh, I, so I, you were I, talking about the bad guy. Oh, yeah, yeah the bad guy in, in the uh, Prince Caspian. I thought he was absolutely menacing and really, truly frightening, but in a way that was safe for kids, where you didn't have to be a serial killer, flesh-eating monster in order to be frightening. But he could just be a guy who has no scruples and uh, is very dangerous to tangle with, even within his own organization. And so when that final fight came between Peter and the leader of the Telmarines uh, at the end of the movie... Uh, even though it was on a battleground with the sun shining, it was still a really exhilarating and fighting and or, uh, frightening and satisfying battle, you know. So, anyway, I, while we, while we were trying to connect back to you, I, I asked the chat to uh, vote on which one of us made the more persuasive argument today. So while we wait for that to come in, <laughs> yeah, I'm dropping the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so. I got a no, feeling. Like, we'll see. Well, we both try to be humble about this. I got one more one more round in this in this debate discussion. The final battle in the final book. Um, Wait, in which book? The, the, the last book of Harry Potter. Uh, of Harry Potter. Okay. Yes, the final battle. Um, were you, how, how did you feel about it? Because I'll, I'll tell you how my interpretation of the final battle, and I've said this to other people, and they're like, no, it wasn't like that at all, but I read the book. Uh, it was <laughs> Harry and he who shall not be named circling each other going, uh, hey, I know this about you. You dare? Yes, I dare. And what's more, I dare this. How dare you? And hey, wait, I got another dare for you. Ah, yeah, you, you're so daring in how much you dare me. And then finally, after this 12, 15 pages of circling each other saying, you dare, yes, I dare, zap, and it's over. That's that, valid. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, oh my gosh, that bothered me. Um, yeah, I would say that that one of the weakest things about the books is that the showdowns there's it's it's not she's not writing satisfying showdowns she's she's writing satisfying build ups showdowns don't have great payoff they're not epic battles they're not um i think that's where the movies actually are superior to the books is that i think the filmmakers uh take it to the next level a little bit better sort of mm -hmm. make it more satisfying i mean the thing that i didn't like about the first book is that it sort of ends with like at the height of uh, dramatic tension of of Harry sort of facing Voldemort for the first time, he sort of just passes out. And then it's like, he passed out. And then he wakes up and he's in the hospital. What happened? And I, I'm mm -hmm. not a fan of that uh, that kind of cop-out kind of thing. But um, yeah, that's why I'm not, I'm not saying they're perfect books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, and, and I'm just trying to describe to you now where I get stuck. But Well, I do think you need to read them in order. I mean, I know that that's, you know, everybody's going to say, you know, like... You got to like, start in episode of, one. <laughs> yeah. I think of all the anime kids that are like, yeah. you have to read every single volume of this 50 yeah. volume thing. You know, like, you know, to be fair, like, anytime you watch a finale or read a finale of something that you did not invest all the time to get there, you know... That's true. Things are going to look a little bit less. Things are going to seem more robotic. They're not going to seem... You're not going to care as much. So you're just sort of like viewing it, you know was, you know, how did it end? How did it end? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I have to say, well, it, it also depends. And I have disappointments. I have disappointments with the finale as well. Um, you know, I think to me the biggest disappointment was just that for a book that really talked about the sort of complexity and the sort of grayness of good versus evil, um, the house, the, you know, the, the fact that the school is broken up into the four houses, the Slytherins all kind of, you know, sort of all grouped together in a way that was surprising based on what had been built up to that point. You know, these kids who seem like they were the bad kids 
at the end of the book, they kind of were just bad kids and not a lot of them sort of questioned, you know, wh- you know, what their other Slyth- Slytherins were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a little, that was a little disappointing, but yeah. Well, and you know, to be fair, and this is where we're being like, this isn't a debate. This is us just being like, well, you know, I see your side of things too. Uh, I have to admit that going into a book not having read the previous books, uh, and also with an attitude of, and this is this was the mindset I had going into it, it's like, well, let's see if she learned how to write after that first book, you know, after this many books, maybe she's got a better writing style by now. And that's that's kind of was like this kind of <laughs> crossed arms way of like, and as I'm reading through the book, I'm like, whew, she's still doing it. She's still doing the, oh, Harry was mad. And, uh, oh, and Hagrid's still crying. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm not saying that you have to always go into a book with the proper attitude, right? It, it's, it's everybody's prerogative to have their own attitude. But your description has got me thinking that, okay, maybe I need to look at this the same way I look at a, a Saturday morning cartoon series, where if I'm going to get mad at somebody for picking on, you know, GoBots because it, it, it's the, they're comparing it to Mad Men, you know, then should I be comparing Rowling to, you know, literature of almost 100 years ago? But I, I, think, that, I think the most valid comparison is to compare it to Avatar The Last Airbender, mm-hmm. in that if you approach it as, hey, this is a Saturday morning cartoon show for kids, holy cow, I can't believe that they're adding all this extra nuance. Wow, this is really layered. Wow, this is really great. Is it as layered as, you know, the most grown-up, you know, fiction? No. But if you start off that it's like, oh, this is kids' entertainment, but, oh, wow, look at all the things that she's doing within the parameters of kids' entertainment. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest of which is having the characters grow up. I mean, the stories do get more complex. They do mature. And even though maybe the finale wasn't as, you know, complex and as, as nuanced as everything she had been building up prior you know, the ride getting there is still really rewarding. And I think that there is a lot more depth to the Harry Potter series than you might think. But if you go in like, you know, with an attitude of like, prove to me, like, you know, like you're never going to really be satisfied. I think that that's why I hate to be the guy that's like, you know, trying to convince somebody to see, you know, why don't you love this thing that I love? Because but you, you came up with this topic. <laughs> this was your topic you brought to the show. So why do you hate bringing this up? Well, because I'm willing to do it. I do it <laughs> because I care, Jersey. Oh, Dave. Because I think you're missing out. And and, and Sarah Turner and I, uh, you know, we want we really want to, you know, go to LeakyCon with you someday. There's what is it called? <laughs> LeakyCon. It's a big Harry Potter convention that's happening this weekend uh, <laughs> at, at in Orlando at the Harry Potter. Uh, theme park dave you're scooting out of the shot again oh sorry <laughs> if you could just turn the camera just a little bit to your right or or you're fine where you are right now but yeah every time you started leading it was just looking at your ear um well okay well i'll go to i'll go to that con if you go to a, a bot con with me oh that's fine I, yeah um yeah see i i but I, at the same time like i'm not someone who's necessarily dissuaded by passion and people that are really you know excited about something like if i hear enough people are excited about something i i I obviously want to check it out um but i think the problem is a lot of people have that attitude of like oh you know everyone keeps talking about this thing so if it's not the best thing in the world i'm going to i'm going to be you know annoyed with my friends or i'm going to be annoyed with my twitter list or whatever oh yeah oh yeah that's that's definitely yeah a lot of people fall prey to that kind of attitude of uh well it's 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 some kind of like a negative variation of the phantom menace syndrome where everybody was so excited so excited that it had to have been you know the blood of god pouring on them in order for them to enjoy it you know Uh, i don't even know if that was an accurate description but you know just something like (laughs) some some kind of ecstasy had to happen in that film and so nobody's gonna like it it's always gonna go down in history amongst our generation is the worst movie ever made worse than ed wood movies because it didn't deliver on this this imagined uh, ecstasy that we we're going to experience, and I think when people see uh, people going absolutely spiritually mad over something like that, then they like, oh, you know, uh, yeah. You know, well, that's I think the, the most me. interesting thing about Star Wars, and, and we'll do another episode about Star Wars. Um, Are we? Is, is is the generation of kids who didn't watch the original films first, and they're just sort of coming in it, and they're watching it in George Lucas's preferred order, which is episodes <laughs> one, two, three, and then four, five. You know, yeah. like they have a very different perspective on it than people yeah. who grew up 
you know, loving the Star Wars films and then see Phantom Menace and they're like, what? This does not live up to my, you know, expectations that I've had, you know, in all those years that passed between films. Yeah. Um, to that end, I would actually love it if Gail Williams... Um, oh, I was going to ask. I was going to ask if she... Yeah, is she uh, there? And talk a little. She is here. Um, are you ready, Gail? Are you able to come in? Okay. I'm going to pass the mic, as they say. Oh. Um... <laughs> Oh, you guys can't share the mic? But, well, hi, Gail. I'll get a chair and I'll come back by. Oh, but, awesome. but Gail, Jersey, Jersey Gail. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Gail. So um, I guess you uh, have been working with Dave for some time. And uh, D- Dave, Dave said that you had a defense for Harry Potter because you have a lot of friends who don't get it too, right? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a pretty simple few points, um, if you'd like to hear. <laughs> um, Let's oh, we, I, should, I should introduce you properly. You've been oh, uh, working as an assistant for, for Dave and, and Raina, and, right. which means what do you do for them? Um, whatever they need. I have done planning, <laughs> planning, a lot of racing, <laughs> um, and occasional helping out at cons. Oh, so you're doing all the, the, the uh, drudgery and tedium of being a cartoonist. Yes, but it's so fun. Is it? And, it and, is, it really is. And Gail is a great web cartoonist as well, and we'll link to it in the show notes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, where, where, where can people find you right now for people who are watching this live? Yeah, um, patbird.gailsaur.com. That's P-A-T-B-I-R-D dot G-A-L-E-S-A-U-R dot com. Okay. That's my webcomic updating Thursdays. Cool. All Ooh. right, we'll link to that in the show notes too. So if anybody <laughs> didn't remember that, you can just go to comicsgreat.com slash C-A-G-2-0 and you will be able to get it. So, okay, now, your defense. Okay. Convince me. Number one, um, it's this whole, like, really well-defined world with a lot of depth, but it's still accessible to both kids and adults. Like, I love Lord of the Rings and a lot of fantasy ethics, but reading them can be a commitment, and I'm looking at you, Wheel of Time. <laughs> um... Point two being, um, there are these characters that, like, you get to... Tiny breath. Taking a breath. (laughs) (laughs) Just watch them grow and enjoy these huge character arcs over the course of seven years. And you get to see, for example, Neville Longbottom going from being the kid with the toad to the leader of a rebellion. Everyone's really interesting and weird and relatable. And you kind of get a feeling for why they are the way they are. Even the janitor Filch. Um, three, like the story's really action-packed and gets darker and darker, but it never just goes from one big thing to big thing to big thing until you're like running a marathon or something. Like there's always that light-hearted, quieter moment that you can really just breathe in and have it resonate. Um, and four, on a broader scale, it got a whole generation of kids into reading again. Um, and opened the door for a lot of great young adult authors and became a book that you could really talk to anyone about. Like, I remember having a lot of great conversations with friends and high school teachers. And I could tell you where I was when I got the seventh book and read it <laughs> all night long. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 was, that was another part of, like, the cultural uh, heritage of this book series was all the people who read it all night. And they could live journal about it, they could tweet about it, they could, you know, Facebook about it or whatever was the popular social network at the time, you know. So, yeah, that, that, that's a power that uh, a new series has that an old series just can't take advantage of. There's never going to be, like, a, everybody in the world reading one of the books of Chronicles of Narnia in one night, unless it's, like, some kind of special event that people start, you know? But, Which would be really cool. <laughs> it would be really cool, but, but I mean, it, it was baked into the Harry Potter series because it was coming out over the last ten yeah. years, right? So. That's what I've got. <laughs> but what about okay i forgot about this one because dave uh tweeted me yesterday uh oh what was it that you put on there i gotta look it up you posted the name to one of the characters um and and i was like i had to double check is that a real character <laughs> oh uh mundungus fletcher who i looked up and I, I realized okay yeah he is a guy but then i was like yeah that's another thing he, uh you know, pickle, pickle feet, hung de bung. All these names like that. <laughs> it doesn't bother you guys, or am I just, am I just cynical and curmudgeonly for not? Li- <laughs> I think that's where, that's where I'm talking about the sort of roll doll whimsy of the series. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's 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 roots are in middle grade. It's supposed to be names that are fun to say. It's supposed to be things that are 
very visual and sort of gross. Like, like, uh, like, how serious can you get about a story about a school that's called Hogwarts? <laughs> yeah, the school's called Hogwarts, you know. The main character, Dumbledore, you know. Everything is supposed to be sort of cartoony and fun. And, and that's why I think Marie Grand Prix's illustrations are so great, because she's really tying into that you know like a lot of people want to make Severus Snape into like Trent Reznor you know this sort of like serious guy but like in the illustrations in the first book he's got this sort of like cartoony mustache and he's much more sort of yeah, yeah. over the top you, um, know, you know another thing I think about is like the spells you know Pentrificus Difficus and all those things uh, which you know some people might get a little uh, you know roll their <laughs> eyes at but you know what it reminds me of is it, it this goes back to your point about it being you got to remember the, the enjoy it in the spirit that it was intended aimed at young people you know you watch power rangers and they announce all of their attacks right they they telegraph all their moves and they announce it like exactly what they're going to do the new super martial art thing they're going to do and it totally reminds me of the kind of stuff you do on the playground when you're a little kid uh where you say deflector shield to protect yourself against because when you're playing pretend you have to announce what you're doing so that the kids know so when I watched Power Rangers, I found that to be a really, really cool way to introduce that, that, that concept into an action series aimed at kids. And that's totally what I think of when I think of those spells, as much as sometimes I go, oof, when I hear some of the, the pickledy-foot, bungledy-bung kind of <laughs> language in there. But uh, anyway, but that's a that's Yeah, a that's exactly it. Uh, right at the finish line. We trip at the finish line. You there, Dave? <laughs> seconds I, that's the only way i can tell is that oh the network thing yeah hey guys can you hear us now or are you still yeah, there i'm here are we there cool okay it's weird because it like takes a few minutes before we realize we're disconnected <laughs> yeah we're still we're still going no actual disconnect so we should we should actually wrap up here in a second but uh it sounds like uh, people are pretty torn on who won i think people are getting uh people are being too nice to me uh, <laughs> Saying saying it's a draw. I don't I don't really feel like I I defended Narnia properly. But uh, oh, Eric's pointing out that Narnia does have pu uh, puddle gum the marsh wiggle. All right, so I, <laughs> I guess I guess you know. It, it, go ahead. And it has Santa Claus. Don't forget that Narnia has Santa Claus. Santa Claus who gives people swords to go fight people. That's so awesome. <laughs> that's like the, one of the greatest scenes ever. Oh man! I know, but that's where like a lot of my friends like they're like, "What? Santa Claus shows up?" And he's like, "Dude, you you were along for the ride with the talking beavers, but when Santa Claus shows up, it's a problem." Oh, that is one of the greatest scenes ever. Is when Santa Claus comes up to give them weapons. You're gonna need this. Oh, Santa Claus give you a sword. That means like that, that's that's sanctioned violence right there. So. Okay, anyway, uh, let's wrap this up and uh, head home. Uh, so everybody should go today, uh, show your, put your money where your mouth is, and vote for Dave uh, for his compelling uh, defense of Harry Potter by going out and purchasing a copy of Astronaut Academy at Indie... IndieBound.com. IndieBound.com. Uh, Grace, did you help out on this book? She helped out on book two. That's Oh, you already worked on book two. A little bit of a, a bomb drop there. Uh, are, are you going to be doing any appearances anytime in the near future that we should let people know about? Um, I'll be at the San Diego Comic Con. Oh, that's right. Lots of, uh, I'll be at the Slave Labor Graphics table and at the First Second table at various times. Go to my website, yaytime.com, for the complete list because I'm going to be all over the place. By the way, I looked at the Yaytime site. It looks fantastic now. Oh, now, thank it, you. Thank it, you so much. It was looking a little dated, but you gave yeah. it a, a facelift, and it's looking yeah. awesome now. Yeah. It works now. Well, I've, been, <laughs> I've been listening to all your talks about WordPress and all stuff. So. So, and the Art and Story uh, podcast. Oh, yeah, that, those other things that I do, uh, artandstorypodcast.com and uh, comicsagreat.com is where you can find everything that I do. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so uh, that's where you can find out where to get Astronaut Academy. That's where you can find out what Dave's going to be next. I do have, I, I'm supposed to do a calendar thing, and I'll do it really fast today. Um, oh, can I just say, Gail, you're going to be at Oticon? That's right. Oh, <laughs> what's the web site for Oticon, and when is it? Um, Oticon is July 29th through 31st. Um, I think it's just Oticon.com, but feel free to check me on that. And okay. Yeah. If you, yeah. Oh. If you Google Oticon, you'll find it. It's like the largest anime con on the East Coast. Okay. okay. So cool. Okay. So then um, I got some Ann Arbor announcements to make in terms of dates uh, and times. Let me go to my events list here, and then I got to play the uh, the little carryover stinger for. Should we say goodbye real quick? Can we just? Mischief managed. Mischief oh managed. yes, Grace. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for coming on, Grace, and uh, I'll look forward to meeting you soon. Um, 
and we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Well, where, where are you on the Twitters, if people want to follow you on Twitter? Ah, um, Kelvarin. K-E-L-V-A-R-I-N. <laughs> I know, I just make everything hard on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but yes, that you're, on, you're on Twitter, and uh, eventually we'll get you on Google Plus too, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll talk about that another time, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Rudolph told me it was bad, so I'm not going to do it. Oh, Mark hates it, but I, I, I adore it because I can have all the nerdy conversations I want with the people who actually care about it, and I don't flood up other people's feeds with my, my uh, stupid you know, thoughts and sound effects and stuff. But anyway, well, that's for another time. Okay, so um, real quick, play the... And that means it's time to talk about stuff going on in Ann Arbor. Uh, right now, the Comic Book Academy and Comics Fundamentals classes are in full swing. Uh, Comic Book Academy is every Tuesday from 1 to 3 p.m. at the Mallets Creek branch. At, you just go to AADL.org to find out more information about that. That's a uh, kids' comics class that I'm teaching, and it's a lot of fun. There's a video series actually on the Ann Arbor District Library website which I can link to in the show notes where you can uh, preview what's to come. It's designed, I mean, it's, it's underway now, but it's designed to be a class that you can dip in and out of if you want, so you don't have to attend every class. But, you know, it's, it's always better if you attend every class. Um, and then Wednesdays, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Pittsfield branch, we have the Comics Fundamentals class, which is if you are an adult who has always wanted to take a comics course, this is uh, soup to nuts, learning how to make a comic from the ground up, and you don't have to even know how to draw in order to take the class. You'll learn, because there's uh, alternate classes going on, to support this series uh, starting this Saturday, July 9th. Create and draw cartoony characters. Oh, no, July 9th has already passed. I'm thinking of July 16th. Create and draw anthropomorphic animals characters with Janie Ho, who did the art for the summer reading game. And uh, that's at, at Saturday, July 16th, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. at the Downtown Library Multipurpose Room. So you can learn how to draw, so then you can come back to the Comics Fundamentals class and uh, exercise your skill by learning more about storytelling. July 15th, this Friday, uh, the Story Collider is returning to the Ann Arbor District Library, where science and hilarity combine. It's sort of like the moth talks, where people just tell stories, but with science. Uh, that's Friday, July 15th from 7 to 9 p.m. Again, all these events are available at AADL.org. So, oh, it looks like I lost Dave again. So I'm going to wrap up, and I will give him a shout-out again. He's at yaytime.com, yaytime on Twitter, uh, yaytime.tumblr.com, I believe. And uh, thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. And uh, I'll see you guys. Well, there will not be a show next week, but the week after we will resume. And I think I'm going to have Dave back again uh, for another visit to talk about uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and more. So uh, the show is available at comicsaregreat.com. And uh, very soon you'll be able to get even more uh, about the show from AADL.org. Until next week, everybody. Or well, until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of jdroz.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.